The meeting is being recorded. Folks, it's the weekly Q&A, no longer the weekly webinar. Dr. James, Dr. Mike, in person. We're next to each other. This is bizarre. This never happens. I don't know why. It happens maybe a couple times a year. Times a year. So folks, we're here in Montana. We're here to answer your questions. So we're just going to jump right in and get to it. It's always fun to do these side by side instead of over Zoom. We were just laughing because we were like looking at some of the comments and there's always some like jokes that we don't remember even saying. Like, what was the fruit? I don't remember this at all. All right. So I'm thinking we start at, <laughs> this guy's name's Dick Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dick. <laughs> we don't have to read his question. I was just laughing at his name. Oh. Well, let's, let's hit him up. Okay. Hey, docs, I'm a type 1 diabetic, and I've been training for the last six years pretty heavily and planned. I've got pretty jacked to the point anytime I go out to the bar or club, I'm approached by men telling me how thick with two Cs I am <laughs> or questioning my bench numbers. I wonder if I have good genetics or if it's the anabolic nature of all the insulin. For the first few years of lifting, I ate very high carbs and protein meal for every meal, like 300 plus grams carbs and 100 plus grams protein for post-workout yeah, meals. I also had to dose the insulin accordingly. Uh, I've <laughs> since eased off the large doses to stay leaner. You guys are fucking awesome. Thank you for all the content. So it was mostly your genetics and your good training, but the insulin sure didn't hurt and probably helped at the margins. Yeah, normally we would say like for people who are dealing with diabetes, like you might kind of the, the benefit you might gain from the insulin is often offset by the lifestyle that you have to live. So you kind of probably are at a net neutral, but in this case, it sounds like you're your body's soaking it up. Smashing it's that like, shit. hell yeah. Give me that. Give Somewhere me some. Marcus Roll is applauding. Yum, yum. Give me some. Insulin. Parentheses. Mm -hmm. All right. How about Tomer with the uh, Naruto? So Tamer says, should I aim to eat as soon as I wake up to maximize MPS? So generally what we give as decent advice is if you eat within an hour, maybe two hours of when you wake up, you're doing probably a really good thing. If you're waiting two to three hours or longer after you wake up to eat, you're definitely missing out on potential growth time. And I would say at the margins, you are also a little bit more catabolic for longer than you want to be. So it's not a good idea. Generally speaking, you want to spread your meals out relatively evenly. So as soon as you wake up, I think James and I just don't want people to get the perception that like if you don't have a protein shake by your bed, you're going to die of right. metabolism. But you can wake up, walk your dogs, uh, take a shower, poop, brush your teeth, get out and eat. You're totally good to go. Yeah, I think a lot of people ask this question in the context of like, um, uh, like fasted cardio, like I want to do my cardio first thing in the morning. And usually we'll say something like if you, for whatever reason, whether you're not a morning eater, maybe you have a hectic morning schedule, or maybe you want to do some like fasted cardio, you can kind of split the difference and maybe just have like a little bit of your whey protein shake, maybe some carbs in there. And just it's a slightly better than nothing at all for like several hours post work, uh, post waking up. But at the same time, like Mike said, don't think that like the first thing you have to do is sprint to your, your meal. And if you don't do that, then something's wrong. That's, that's not the case at all. Yep. Okay. Let's do some more here. Arene MC. Arene. Our buddy Arene MC. SpongeBob going. That's right. Under what circumstances will you change out an exercise mid-meso? So it's really um, mid-meso, we, we definitely try to stick with what we've chosen because it can throw off the rest of your thing if you introduce a new exercise. But what James and I probably say is the definite reason is you have persistent growing pain doing that exercise in like joints or something. So like if your knee is like owie on the hack squat one day and then the next day it's like owie, owie, owie and the day after you can barely warm up, it's time to stop hack squatting. Um, if you have a really crappy SFR, you can change out your exercises, but we think that most cases keep trying to fiddle with it, alter the technique a little, slow down the reps, trying to get the mind muscle, maybe play with a technique to try to get the best SFR. Worst case scenario is at the end of the meso, you'll be like, nah, I'm not doing that for a while. Right. But generally speaking, yeah, pretty much like the best reason to change out or compelling one is persistent, increasing localized pain. 
Uh, if that's not the case, then you can probably stick it out in most cases for the meso. You don't have to go further than that. Yeah, I think you you could make a case about like if the exercise has gone like so flat, your MEV, MAV values are like, you know, 10 sets to get anything going on the movement, then you could be like, okay, this one's just not going that great. But even then I would still agree with Dr. Mike where it's like, just finish out whatever you were doing and have a nice clean slate on the next one. So what we don't want is for people to say like, oh, you said you can swap out exercises because they're stale or flat, uh -huh. but then it's like, you're never doing anything consistent. It's very hard to track and you're never making like really tangible progress on the movements that you've chosen for a nice extended period of time. I think some of the best training you'll have is when you pick a movement that has a good SFR and you're able to use it for like three or more mesocycles without it going flat, that's when you're going to see like huge, huge gains in whatever either strength or muscle mass on that particular movement. Yep. There's another thing too. If you are real quick to switch away from a non-optimal SFR move, you're like, nah, this, I'm not feeling it. You're actually potentially losing out on playing around with the technique and the setup and finding out a really good SFR movement. So for example, if we put you on like a a flat machine press, like you had the seat a little back and you had your close grip pressing position because that's mm -hmm. where you felt better on all the other machines. And you're like, this just hurts my shoulders and elbows. I'm gonna rotate it out. Okay, but what if you tried it two or three more times, put the seat forward more to get a bigger stretch and widen your, your pressing grip. And all of a sudden, two sessions later, you're like, oh my God, this is direct chest blast. Yeah. Had I walked away from this, I wouldn't have figured out. And I actually like hack squat for me, the way I used to do it, hurt my knees so much that I just told people not to hack squat. I didn't do it for years. And then I finally stuck with it and developed a really great technique. And now it's one of my favorite quad exercises. So it's kind of like, don't walk away too soon. If you're advanced, sometimes, you know, if you're advanced, you just won't pick exercises, you know, or shift for you. But if you're a beginner or intermediate, stick around, you might find out how to really optimize things. And when you are advanced, very often, like what you'll find is like, you're trying, to, you're trying something new because like, you're like myself where you're like, I have a at home setup. I've exhausted some of my like barbell movements. Let me try these sissy squats or something. And then you do it and you're like, this is fucking terrible. Yeah. Let's just do something like a lunge or whatever else. And just be, and that's when where you nip it in the butt right away. And yeah. you say like week one, even in session one, session one is a warm up, And then you switch to a relax. You just, you just know it's not happening, but when you're a beginner or intermediate, it is worth playing around with more and just to get a feel for it. This name. What the fuck? Sigurdur. Hermansen. Sounds like some Mordor shit. Sorry, Sigurdur, nobody upvoted you. So yeah. you have to, Sorry, with homie. your Viking sword. How about Michael Ong? Michael Ong says, hey doctors, I have a question in regards to loading variation within a microcycle. In a previous video, Dr. Mike recommended to possibly have loading variation within a microcycle, such as five to 10 reps early in the microcycle, 10 and 20 and 20, 30 reps later in the same microcycle. Would this be recommended to during cutting phase? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or is this something that should be geared more towards massing and possibly maintenance? No, maintenance doesn't matter much as long as you're stimulating something a little bit. It's really quite easy. Maintenance, if you're a beginner or intermediate, it's probably best to do mostly five to 10 because it allows you the lowest possible volumes, but also practice lift, doing heavy lifting, which you're going to need. If you're more advanced, especially really big and strong, you actually do your maintenance a lot with sets of 20 to 30 because you want to give your joints a break. Because like if you're always squatting 600 pounds and leg pressing 800, like you need to back the fuck away from that shit for mm -hmm. a little while. And it says, I understand that higher reps have better SFRs during a cut. Yeah, progressively so during the cut as it goes on. So I'm not sure if I have a varied loading range that would be recommended during a cut. So we actually address this in our Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy book. We actually address your exact question showing how your loading ranges within the weeks should alter over the mesocycles in a cut. So there's kind of a phase potentiation there. So get, get a look at that. But generally speaking, you do a mix of all of them. It's just when you add volume in your later mesos, you add it to the slower twitch, or sorry, to the higher rep ranges, not the lower ones. I haven't seen this thumbnail for a long time. And I just, it's, I caught it out of the corner of my eye and I fucking hate this one. It's so distracting and weird looking. I can't unsee it. Yes, that's why goddamn people, arm I, one. We were hoping it people, more, more people would click on it, but I think it scares people away. So it only has <laughs> 21,000 views. Oh God, it bothers me. Um, but yeah, I totally, and then you could make a case too, like for your maintenance phases, it might be good to conserve um, some of the rep range variability that you might benefit from more during masking or cutting. So like Mike said, usually we'll say like do five to 10 ish reps during your maintenance because it pushes your necessary volume so low. Maybe like you could use the 10 to 20 on some movements like arms, like you're not going to be doing sets of six on your biceps necessarily. So arms might keep higher, delts might keep higher, but um, you might actually get more out of those 
you know, maybe 15 or more uh, rep ranges, when you're doing something like a cut or a mass, so it might be good to conserve those for later on, unless like Mike said, you're, you're dealing with injuries and things like that. Let's see. Not a ton of upvotes on some of these. We'll get to someone. How about gingerbread boy here? This is kind of an interesting one. Similar note that we just talked about. Gingerbread boy says, I'm currently one third of the way through a cut and I want to swap out some exercises. Some because they've become stale. Some I want to change for new exercises to see what kind of SFR they have. Would it be better to wait until I'm in a massing phase? Would I be missing out on any potential additional gains by changing exercises whilst on a cut? Post a change when I start my next mass phase. I don't think you're missing out on much of anything. You can change it. Just make sure you're not abandoning exercises you could have had as good variants. Um, that's the only thing I'd say. I also would say be careful about changing exercises really often on a cut because one of the reasons you do the same exercise, a small one, but nonetheless one that's noted, is you want to keep tabs on your rep strength to see if it's staying you know, stable at least so you know you're not fucking up and losing muscle. If you lose exercises, if you use exercises like very different ones every week or two, you could actually be getting weaker and not know it because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, it's all novelty. I'm getting great pumps. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I got a lot weaker on the exercise that mattered. So. And then, so I'm not against doing that either. The one thing I will just caution you is I think during a cut in particular, you're probably more susceptible to what we call a type two error, a false negative, where you're already just kind of flat and blah. So you might switch a new yes. exercise out and you're like, oh, I feel flat and blah, but you would have felt flat and blah anyway. Whereas on mass, it'll be just more obvious that the, oh, like, damn, well, and you could also maybe say on mass, you might be prone to making a false positive as well. But I think the cut is more noticeable in that, like you just, even if it's good, you might not get a, a big pump or a lot of soreness either way. So just be careful with that. It's not that doing it on a cut is bad. It's just, that's just something to look out for. Let's see. <laughs> let's do it let's do the vertical oh, leg yes, press finally all right <laughs> kyle hauser asks vertical leg press i turned the garage into a gym during the pandemic due to limited supply of right and rising cost of gym equipment the only leg press machine i was able to acquire was a vertical leg press there's a reason for that fine <laughs> um it was not, it is not great the position is awkward Brahm is limited and i have trouble isolating the quads do you have any tips for making this exercise work better should i just sell the damn thing <laughs> tip it tip it 45 degrees that's the best way <laughs> What you can do is put a real big pad underneath your butt slash hip area, and then you can make it a little bit better. It's not going to make it any more comfortable, but it will make it hit the quads more, um, which essentially just turns it more into a 45 degree press. But honestly, whenever you get a chance to sell it and buy a real leg press, I would do that. I would just buy Arsenal's leg press because the Arsenal leg press is the best leg press currently on the market. And uh, believe it or not, designed by people who lift weights to allow you to lift weights. <laughs> the vertical leg press is like James and I were literally just talking about this before we started recording. We're just upset that it even exists. So. All it does is cause you like causes the human to turn into like a roly poly. Just basically, it just there's no thanks. There's nowhere to go. Um, so we're not a fan of that one. Um, I honestly, I can't think of any way you can Jimmy rig it to make it better. I would say at that point, it might just turn into like a cool strongman implement where you just like find a way to load it on your shoulders and you could do like strongman squats yeah. or something. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> you stand in the middle of it, turn yeah. upside down. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, JR has a question that's super upvoted. Okay, All right. let's do that one. What JR asks, what do you mean when you say you can add a light session on another day? Example, heavy bench one day and light another session later in the week. Are you talking about light up the volume, lightweight, same volume with higher RIR, 50% load? So we usually say, and it's not in all contexts, but in most light session actually just means recovery session. And that usually means you use roughly 50% of a working weight and you do like fewer reps and not anywhere near failure so that it's literally just like warm up slash technique work. And even you can do it at a high velocity. So to get really good at benching, you can boom, put a lot of speed into the bar, but it has to be not pushing your muscles to the limits remotely. That's what it counts as a recovery session. And the colloquialism for that is sometimes light session. We generally try to stay away from saying light sessions and say recovery sessions, because light can mean higher yeah, reps confusing. Uh, and still close to failure, but that's generally the, the gist of what we mean. Yeah. And then sometimes you can use it to literally mean like a lighter type at workout. So you might have like your five to 10 bench press day, which is we might do, you know, some top sets and down sets of just like some heavy bench yeah. and then like a lighter day. And this, again, this is where the 
phrasing gets kind of funky, but you might have a different chest day where you're doing some like 10 to 20 cable flies like that. The, the load that you're placing on the muscle is just way less from those two comparing those two movements. Right. So you could say that's a lighter day, not only in terms of like the actual thing that you did, but in terms of um, like how much sets you did or how many reps you did, blah, blah, blah. You, you can kind of play with it a couple different ways, but generally, like Mike said, it's, that means like a more of a recovery kind of session more often than not. Yeah. Hey, now, actually, this is a really good question. Hey, now, hey what's now. the difference between myo sets and giant sets? They seem very similar. So myo rep sets generally don't target. So giant sets, the way we use them, which is apparently pretty wrong because giant sets mean something else. Everyone else, it means like multiple exercises strung together, which is fucking stupid. What we really mean when we say giant sets is marathon sets which is also stupid. So we're just going to start calling them giant sets and see if we can change the way people talk about <laughs> it. Um, giant set is really easy to define. You take a weight and you give a total number of reps to yourself and you do as many sets as it takes to get to that weight or to get to those number of reps. So let's say you have 20 pound lateral raise dumbbells. You have to get 60 total. You do like a set of 20. It's pretty hard. You stop, you wait however long you want. You can do giant sets with short breaks. You can do them with normal breaks. Usually they're done with normal breaks. So you rest like two minutes and then you do another 12 close to failure to RIR, whatever, then you, you sit around. One of the really great uses of giant sets is that sometimes when you're trying to match reps exactly and get carried away in your mind, muscle connection and technique can break down. Cause you're like, I got to get 19. And then 17, 18, 19 looks like three giant question marks. What the fuck was actually going on with giant set? You know, you have all the time in the world to get to 60 total. So you can stop each set when your technique starts to break down, which means it's a really good way to practice. It's like my new exercise or one that's kind of awkward. Like for example, like if you do bent over dumbbell lateral raises, you can't, you can't rep match on those because that's at some point you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. You start to yeah. do this, your elbows start to bend. It's really hard to standardize. But if you do, okay, today I'm doing 50 total. Next week I'm doing 55. Week after I'm doing 60. The week after I'm going back to 50 book with like two and a half more pounds in each dumbbell. Like that actually works really well. My reps is just when you get into a machine and you say, I'm going to have two my rep rest breaks, which means I get rest break of like three to five seconds when I go close to failure and then I do another little mini set close to failure, I don't put anything down. I don't put it away. I take three to five seconds to get a rest again. That's the second mile rep break. And then I go again. So that's three mini sets, two breaks in between, and then you're done. There's no goal reps at the end of that. Usually you can rep match like that, or you can just say, I'm just going to see how many I can get in the next week. You maybe put five pounds on the bar and match those mini sets exactly and get the same total number of reps with the same two rest breaks. So the Maya reps is definitely one in which you're expected to perform at a certain element. And there's no total a total amount that's usually the goal, whereas they're just organic sets with two rest breaks. Giant sets are really just a bunch of sets strung together with, uh, without as much pressure to whatever number you get in each set really doesn't matter as long as you get the total. Do people really... <coughs> When they say giant sets, they basically are talking like kind of like circuit training, more or less. Literally circuit training. I've never, never understood it to be that. Yeah. Because people would just say circuit training or supersets or something. E exactly. So I don't know. People usually say like, hey, we superset five machines together. And I was like, it's called the giant set. I'm like, what? Okay, I whatever. Think, like Mila Sarchev does shit like that. Uh, yeah. My reps sometimes, if you look at like uh, like nine, 90s, 2000s era muscle and fitness magazines, they would call it rest pause. Same. same rest pause. Yep. My same. reps just particular way of doing rest pause. Yeah. With the rest prescribed at like, oh, depending on who you talk to, three to five or five to 10 seconds. And, and just keep in mind, these are, you know, you can call them intensification techniques or just, you know, modified protocols. But these are things that like probably most people don't really need to fuss with too much sure. until you've kind of exhausted your meat and potatoes, just straight sets yeah. kind of workouts. So usually around that late intermediate stage where, you know, you've got your SFRs dialed in, you have your technique individualized, but you also, you know, have accrued quite a bit of adaptive resistance. So some of your workouts can start to get pretty arduous. These are things that can help kind of dial it back into a more manageable realm for you. But you might also argue that mile reps are one that sucks so bad. Maybe it has the opposite effect in some cases because it's so painful and awful. You got to um, use it strategically. It's strategic, exactly. The the big ticket with mile reps is the realization that being around failure is really hypertrophic, but going all the way to failure is really fatiguing. And then you say to yourself, okay, in one set, I can be around failure for just a few reps and then I have to stop. Or if you do my reps, you can say, I can be around failure at three different mini attempts mm -hmm. and never actually get to failure. So from an SFR perspective, especially for advanced people, my reps, depending on the setup 
if you can rest at the top, like a hack squat, you just lock out your knees and you can sit there for minutes and be fine. You know, you don't like mire up exercises like dips. You don't mire up dips because you up there, you're like, I get three seconds until I can do one more dip. This isn't rest. So with my reps, you can float around failure longer and not quite get there, which is kind of the best of all worlds. So it really is a good idea. Yeah, I think like what you said with the setup is nice because something like a cable curl or something like yeah. you just put it down. Like yeah. one, two, three. Okay, go, easy. Go, go. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to do it like a bench press Squat. or something. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> <walk> and... <laughs> okay, what how about what the is fuck is that cream? WTF is that cream asks, hi docs, what in your opinion are best exercise for each major muscle group in terms of the STR ratio, uh, the stimulus to time ratio? I know this is highly person specific, but possibly less so than the SFR ratio as rest slash setup times in the, the T and the STR ratio wouldn't vary as much between individuals. You would think people fuck it up a lot. <laughs> yeah, agreed. At least that would be my uneducated, uneducated guess. For more context, I'm trying to lay out my long-term uh, programming for a period where I won't have as much time for training as I would like to do work. I found that STR ratio a very helpful concept for doing so, but it'd be great to know what exercises actually stand out when ranked by STR. So I'll tell you, I can't say give you exact exercises, but we can give you some rules to follow. One is the more compound, the more muscles they involve, generally the better. So like maybe one of the ultimate STR exercises is the, is the, the clean and press, the clean front squat press. So if you do a clean, and then you do a front squat and then you come up into a press and you rack and do a clean. I mean, that's like 80% of your muscles in your body <laughs> with one exercise. So I'll tell you what, if, if I had someone who had an unbelievably short amount of time, I could do like uh, basically set up three things, set up a barbell at, or a Smith machine where you could do inverted rows and then set up a place for pushups and then do clean, like probably do like a stiff, like a deadlift, switch to clean front squat, press drop, do that exercise until you get really tired, then go do push-ups, then go do bent the inverted rows, and then over again. If that, that is your entire body in three exercises. If you do like three rounds of each, like set close to failure, rest 30 seconds, set close to failure, push-ups, rest 30 seconds, do three rounds of that whole thing, that might actually take you about 10 minutes. And your entire body, like for someone super advanced, it would be maintenance work. But for someone not super advanced, that's a little step forward in 10 minutes. And you could do that every day or every other day or whenever you find the time. Well, I'm glad you brought that part up because we usually when people have such rigid time constraints, they aren't advanced. They're just training for fitness and health and that's right. totally fine. And that I think some there are, I'm, I'm going to go I'm advanced, but I can only train 10 minutes a day. Like, yeah, right on, right. get ready to not be advanced exactly. anymore. And, and that's where like you can kind of go off the deep end a little bit because I was actually, while you were talking about that, I was thinking about some gymnastics movements. Like, can you do a, like a jumping uh, ring muscle up? That's a fucking shitload of yeah, muscle. Yeah. You know, like if you can, if you can do it, I certainly can't, yeah. Jesus Christ. But you can kind of look at some of those things and say like that hits, that checks quite a few number of boxes. And if you're not obviously trying to be like a John Meadows, Ronnie Coleman kind of guy, cause you only have 15 minutes to work out. You could incorporate some of those things. Like Dr. Mike said, kind of like some of the, the weight circuits with some gymnastics type movements. And you can pretty much cover your bases really, really fast. Fuck man. I'll tell you what an interesting combo is. If you're pretty good at pull-ups, you get a pull-up bar set at a certain height. You do a full depth squat jump up, Pull-ups, 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 down, full depth squat jumps, up, pull-ups, maybe just one at a That's time. That's brutal. When you get tired of that, you walk back and you have a stiff leg and deadlift bar. You do a stiff leg and deadlift until you can't, put it down, back up a little, do push-ups, and then you rotate. That's literally your whole body in That's four everything. exercises. It's so, brutal. Yeah. I fuck that. Fuck all that. <laughs> the ST, ST as far as an, as an exercise type, CrossFit won the STR games. Oh, yeah. yeah. Literally the entire purpose of the sport is how much work can you do in how little time. That's all their events. That's literally SDR, like it work and stimulus aren't that different. You know, you just have to wiggle with the exercises. So it's not just mindless work, but it's hitting your muscles and then you're good to go. Yeah. And another real quick recommendation, because, you know, we want you to get some value out of this. When exercises are compound, there are a spectrum from biasing compounds or non-biasing compounds or general compounds or specific compounds. So if a compound that's a biasing compound is, for example, a, a wide grip bench. Yes, it is technically compound, but it barely hits your triceps at all. It hits your pecs a ton. So it's really like a pec fly, but it's a compound movement. So if you're like, yeah, I'm doing compound, like I'm doing wide grip bench and I'm doing like wide grip rows. Like if you're hitting rear delts and your chest, not a whole lot of other shit, 
So you want to do more general, less specific, less isolation-y compounds you know, or less targeted compounds, in which case like close grip bench is a real good one. Because people ask all the time, Did like, those is close grip bench for tricep or is it for chest? Like, well, it's really for a lot of both, mm-hmm. you know? And rows, if you do rows with like a closer in, even underhand rows, they do a lot of your bicep and your, the whole rest of your back. So choose your compounds to the ones that hit the most musculature and not nominally compounds, but end up just really hitting one muscle a lot and with very few others. Yeah, that's really good. And actually, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about the advanced point, like what Mike said, I'm really glad he brought that up because I was just thinking like, well, what do you do if you're advanced? Well, most people would say like, what are my, probably some of my best STR movements? Like we you got your like deadlifts, your kind of like many of your like pressing movements, maybe like incline bench, something like that. But if you're advanced and you have to deadlift like over 400 pounds, you're actually spending the entire session just putting weights on the bar at that point. So that ends up being a bad STR choice in terms of your total session, even though it hits all the muscles because you have to put all the weight on the bar, and take it off. So think about it like that too. Like it you have to be super has to be like up. quick and easy to set up. Dips, push-ups, lunges, mm-hmm. Bulgarian lunges. squats. You don't have to warm up a ton. Mm-hmm. Okay. One more. We have one more. Let's do Believe it. Believe it or not, we get through these quick when we're live and in living color. This one actually had eight replies, only one upvote, but I'm wondering if this is, this is actually, we beat that one to death in a lot of our other books. Yeah. Here we go. Chris. Oh, Chris. Hey, Chris. The, uh, the devil from South Park. <laughs> <laughs> hey, docs. I have a hard time getting good mind muscle connection with my latissimus dorsi, my posterior deltoids. Trapezius and terrors may just say back, motherfucker. Oh, seemed to do most of the pulling. I thought he had a mind muscle connection problem. With I thought that's like, where he was going with too. I was like, I don't that. think about Terry's major like, ever. What the fuck is a Terry's major? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I tell you what, when I was in the military, they called me Terry's major, sir. So I'll come in from a workout and be all disheartened. And I'll be like, how did it go, honey? I'll be like, oh, fucking Terry's majors give me some trouble today. Just couldn't, couldn't feel it. Couldn't, couldn't feel make it. that connection. That's okay. You'll get it next time, honey. You'll get it. And, but like she t- says that, but in her mind, like deep down, she's like, he's never going to get as high. He's not capable of it. She needs to get a big bag. You either can bitch. get a Terry's major connection or you're a piece of shit. It belongs <laughs> not in society. Okay. Hard time getting the lats, but uh, posterior delts, trapezius, and Terry's major seems to be most of the pulling. See my avatar for the imbalance. Well, we can't really see a whole lot there. I can see some scapula. Look, we have big lats. Yeah. So. Do you have any recommendations or tips? Yes. Google lat prayers, otherwise known as straight arm lat pull downs. So basically, you take they're called lat prayers. Because you, you do this. Yeah, that's what Mano says. Anyway, oh, okay, so that's a funny name for it. Yeah, um, you take the bar basically here. You get a real big stretch. It's a cable pulley, and you go all the way down without bending anything. You go all the way down to touch your hips, and you can even come up. Just we have there's a bunch of videos in um, and all over the internet. So front, uh, like, you know, one arm, uh, sorry, um, straight arm pull down, straight arm lat pull down, straight arm lat pulls or lat prayers, Google any of that, and it'll come up. That's a really good thing for you to sort of pre-exhaust with. If you are doing rows and you want even more, and, and so first of all, so first of all, that's the case. Second of all, lots of pull downs, lots of pull ups, different grips, different positions, less rowing, because clearly like, rowing is just going to bias those muscles more. Right? So people are always trying to like rig a row to be as much lat as possible. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, you can just do a pull up that's almost all lat, like, you know what I'm saying? Your upper mm-hmm. back's not going to, your, your tra- traps and shit like that aren't going to help you much. So that is really the kicker is to make sure you're prioritizing exercises that hit the lats more. Now, as far as execution, when you do rows and you still want more lat prioritization, the general rule is don't pull towards your chest, pull towards your hips to your tummy. So if you have a barbell row, pull it down. If you have a machine row, set the seat really high. So you can pull down into your hips. If you're doing one arm dumbbell rows, you can bend and literally take the dumbbell and essentially put it into your pocket every time and then super stretch it out super far like this and then put it back in your pocket as opposed to going to your chest. Um, Another one is to make sure you pause at the peak contraction of each of these lifts to really squeeze your lats back and down together. Another one is instead of pulling down to your clavicles when you do pull downs, try pulling down to your nipple line, but stay as vertical as possible. That fucks your lats right in the ass. Not that great for your shoulders, not that great for the rest of the back, but it really does a world of good. And this entire time that you're doing that, try to really focus on making sure that you can feel your lats. Try some posing. It's like front relaxed. You have to flare your lats out at the bottom. Try that stuff and really do it in the mirror for a bit. Google what front relaxed pose looks like. Do that a bit and you'll get more of a connection with your lats. So that everything you do will come back to that later. Mm, really good. I found that with those straight arm pulls, um, doing them paused makes a huge difference for me as yes. well. So if you, you can kind of just like, if you just do them regular, Usually my triceps get really sore and my lats don't get very sore. But if I do them with like a, just a brief pause or let the weight stack touch down and then do it from a dead stop, 
really, really good for the lats. And I'm somebody who typically has had trouble with lat training as well. Additionally, with your pull down variations, pulling to the chest is really good. But really what you're looking for is to get as much of that elbow coming straight down movement as you can. If you're somebody who traditionally, if you do like a lot of just normal pull downs, you just don't feel it. Try doing some where you really can just focus on having like an MMA, they call this a 12 to six elbow going from 12 to six. Same idea with your pulls, try and do like underhand or close grip ones where you're really just pulling your elbows straight across your body and pulling them down and back. That really seems to help if you have like kind of goofy anthropometry like your boy here, um, especially if like wide grip doesn't do it for you. Like if you do wide grip and everyone's like, dude, wide grip fucks me up so bad. And you're like, I don't get anything out of right. that. Then try, try nail yeah. grip. Milk the eccentric and everything. So don't just let the shit heave down. So when you're doing straight arm pulls, this part should be pretty slow. And also because the lats grow most at the stretch, like every other muscle, your straight arm pull should go to here. And then all the way, so almost back behind the plane of your body. And some assholes on the internet will tell you that deactivates lats. Sweet. Sure as hell does. And then it reactivates them, thus giving them a break, giving maximum stretch under tension and all the good stuff. So give that a shot. And, uh, yeah, you'll, they'll grow. And like some machines, depending on how hard this machine size and how tall you are, you might have to like lean forward a little bit to get the, the good stretch in that position. So if like, if I do it, I'm six one. And you know, if I go all the way up, my arms are going to be right here. So what I have to do is step back a little bit, lean forward, and then I can actually get it to stretch without yeah. bottoming out the machine every single time. So yeah. you have to play around with that a little bit. Another thing you can do is like, so, you know, uh, myself and Jared and, and, and stuff don't agree with this gentleman all the time. We don't have to agree on everything. Coach Kasim is somebody you can go to Instagram and find. He is, you know, really cares about activating the lats specifically and not the upper back. And he's got all kinds of little cool tricks and grips and stuff that work really well. And the real guy knows his stuff. So if you're looking for lat activation, that's good. My only caveat is like, make sure your RIR is still good. Like some of the exercises are, because it's kind of a weird setup and you kind of like, you're like rowing out here in front and it's all lats, but like, it's very unclear, like how hard you could possibly try in that position. Cause <laughs> right. you'll fly out of the chair. You'll get no standardization. So just standardize the movement, try real hard and do those movements first in your workout. So you really get the lats going, I guess, while we're at it, pre-exhausting is a good idea. Pre -exhaust. So start all of your back workouts for your ones that are lat focused anyway, with some real good straight arm pulling, plenty of volume. And then when you go to pull-ups next or pull downs or assisted pull-ups, your lats are going to be the limiting factor and really get torched up. And then you can finish with a row to the hip or something like that. And then it's all lats all the time as the, they're the limiting factors that give out. And sometimes too, Dr. Mike, I don't know if you've noticed this, but like a lot of people will train lats like for sets of like 10 reps and they're like, I don't get anything out of yeah. it. Right. Try doing like sets of like 18, like, you know, much higher 15 reps. 15 to 25, yeah. especially on pull downs and stuff. If you have Versa grips or chalk or straps, all of a sudden your lats are on fire and you're like, oh, okay, sets of five didn't do dick. And it's funny too, because people are like, pull-ups for sets of five really help help me, but lat pull-downs for sets of five to 10 don't do anything. What they're doing is they're not measuring the total time that they're applying tension. A lot of times people's nat people naturally do pull-ups much slower, mm -hmm. especially on the eccentric. Mm -hmm. And they're That's like, true. well, I did sets of five. Like, yeah, that set of five took you 47 seconds. That's what a set of 18 takes you on pull-downs. Do a set of 18, they're like, oh, I have a real similar pump and then soreness and stuff. So definitely play around with that. And I've, that's, I've been doing that for fucking years. Within the last few years when I've noticed like my lat training hasn't been very good, and we're like, why don't I stop just doing sets of 10 for like my lat movements? And then it was like, yeah. like, what was I doing this whole time? That's dummy? Like probably one of the most important things about the stimulus to fatigue ratio concept is to be aware of like what your SFR actually is and stop doing movements that you're like, well, all the guys do them. Like, what are you getting out of this? Like, oh no, my bones hurt. Yeah. Stop fucking doing it. Tendinitis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alter the technique. Stop doing it. Do it in a way that hits you. And a lot of times that means altering rep ranges. And that might look silly to somebody else. You know, like I remember this, this guy who's a really good bodybuilder back in the day. He was a Vietnamese gentleman named Chris Dim. He was a phenomenal bodybuilder. And he said he would do like some sets of legs. It'd be like giant sets, more, more like my rep sets, but like he would do like a hundred reps. Oof. And people are like, why? And he's like, it fucks me up. And I'm like, all right, like you know, that really, really fucks up your muscle. And who are we to say it doesn't? You know what I mean? Just don't don't be that person. That's, that's a really good example of someone who's pretty, pretty open-minded to what their own body is sort of signaling to them. Just don't be that person who's like grinding sets of five and like, my joints hurt a lot, but I never get a pump. Yeah. Like we've literally had people say that. Like, what do you guys mean when you say pump? We're like, what? Let me, let me show you training? something. Like, <laughs> let me show you oh something. Oh my God. Is that a good thing? Like, yes, it's a good thing. God damn it. So yeah, do your best. Is that it for today? That's it. That's the whole thing. We knocked them out. All right, folks. Thanks for the questions. Again, just a little housekeeping. Make sure if you are looking through the questions to upvote the ones that you like, even if it wasn't the one that you particularly had in mind, but if you're like, hey, that guy's got a 
pretty sharp question. Gee whiz, mister, that's a fine whiz. question. I wish I was that smart. <gasps> yeah, give that an upvote. And then if your question is not present in the current uh, milieu of questions, then go ahead and toss yours in there and hopefully other people will give it an upvote as well. Dr. Mike, any goings on that the people need to know about? I'm in uh, Montana here during 4th of July visiting my old buddy James. And uh, look, you're, ca- you're catching me in a rare moment of sobriety this weekend. <laughs> And I don't drink alcohol, if you know what I mean. We're like, he's sober. Let's do the webinar. Um, I actually go, took go, like go. 20 yeah, grams of anything. edibles right before. So like, this is, we're timing out. Like, Mike, what do you think of this extra got, question? I'm like, gonna go. where am I? <laughs> um, nothing on my end. Same business as usual, keeping secret projects secret. So folks, for now, we're going to sign off. Hope you guys have a wonderful 4th of July Happy weekend. Happy birthday, America. America, 1776. Boy. what man best day in fucking uh, all time. Don't blow your fingers off. Don't burn your house down. Shoot as many fireworks as possible safely and preferably at other people. Be safe. See you next time. Bye.